welcome to another episode of Grandma's Room. I'm here with Joffrey. I almost said Ben by accident. I'm Ben. <laughs> uh, and today, we're going to be talking about Life Undercover, Part 2 by Amaryllis Fox. I said that right. Part 2. And Operation Barney. Barney. Barn Yard. Barn he? Barn heave. Dude, Barn Yard. I forgot about that movie. Back to the Barn Yard. You remember they had the fake arms <laughs> holding the pizza? Mm-hmm. That was a good movie. Cal Tippy. Was that part of the movie or is it the show? Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. Remember. Okay. So, Joffrey, would you like to start? I guess, yeah. Yeah, do it. You sick old. I'm going to dive right into it. Uh, where we left off <clears throat> from Life Undercover was when she was just starting to understand, like, like the torture that CIA was doing to like targets that they didn't know were who they were actually after. Cause remember we were talking about like, if you don't, if somebody's listening to this, you're not going to understand this. If you don't listen to two episodes ago, well just catch us up to speed. Do, do a quick summary. Okay. She, Amarillis Fox, she joined the CIA and she was, she was like work. She was working in a middle Eastern terrorist like unit and she was starting to see, um, like, these people in the Middle East, they would all have the same name, like, as part of their name. Like, there's a million, like, millions of people with, like, I forget what name it was. Like, it's just, they all have the same name, and it literally meant from Egypt. Like, their name, that then the common name. And the <coughs> common name was from Egypt. And there's just multiple names like that. So, like, police officers and stuff, like, over in the Middle East would tip off the CIA, be like, hey, this guy's here, but it's just because he had the common name. Mm -hmm. So these people would just get arrested and interrogated, and then once they figured out they had the wrong person, they would just, like, leave him in the middle of a road and be like, find your way home. Like, and we left off where she was, like, she kept, like, bugging her superiors to try to get something to change, and they're like, okay, you can change it if you want. And, but she couldn't because it was, she was, like, one person. Mm -hmm. So, part two... She meets her first detainee, and she gains his respect, and they become something like friends, even though they're still enemies. Um, she finds that getting on their good side and finding like a, a mutual respect for each other is way more effective than torturing answers out of them, mm -hmm. which un understandable. But this guy tells her about a place where he knows explosives for a truck bomber being kept. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Because he doesn't agree with the target that his organization's going to be, like, blowing up. I guess there's, like, too many civilians or whatever. And uh, he says, oh, yeah, my next, set of li my next line of notes. He says there's too many civilians there. And this is where she learns that um, slow, hard-earned, like, mutual respect are more useful than waterboarding or enhanced interrogation, like I just said. Her boyfriend around the time is a foreign national. I forget his name. Fuck me. It's not, that's not his name. <laughs> He's a foreign national, and they want to move in together, but they aren't allowed to unless they're engaged or married because of her job. You can't just, like... You move in with anyone. Yeah, they have to be vetted. A lot of the time, I think, like, if you want to move in together, you have to be married to them. That's why, like, a, a bunch of, like, people in the CIA marry other CIA people because it's, like that and if your spouse isn't in the cia i mean i guess even if they are like if they are in the cia you can't tell them what you're doing for a living but like it it's like a mutual understanding if you're both cia yeah it's not like, like i can't tell you this and you can't tell me that yeah it's not like <clears throat> not like your husband works at like some office in town and, and it's like yeah how was that how was that stock meeting couldn't tell you and then that's it but like yeah wait wait, wait for, can you hear that what? The whining. No. Okay. Uh, they get they get engaged. He flies to the U.S. I think he was in England. And his name's Anthony. That's what it is, Anthony. They, he thinks they're going to their apartment from the airport, but she takes him to another building up to a room, Suite 201, which ends up having a lie detector in it and a strange man sitting in it. And they want to make sure he's not a spy before they can get married or anything. Because, like... There is people that play these long games like spies and stuff for years. Mm -hmm. Like totally different identities. Yeah. 
and nobody else would ever suspect them. So they just need to make sure he's not a spy, like, trying to weasel his way into somebody in the CIA. He passes and is okay with it. Like, he, he understands. He's like, oh, you're in the CIA. Like, yeah, it's understandable. He was like, he kept, like, getting worked up during it. Like, what is this? Which is understandable. Yeah, if you don't know, like, you're... Say you're meeting someone in a hotel room and... At, at this time, he didn't even know she was in the CIA. Okay. Like, he wasn't allowed to know. That's why they took the lie detector test and everything. So he passes it. A month after they get married, she gets assigned to CTC slash WMD, which is the part of the counterterrorism unit that makes sure terrorists don't get nuclear weapons or chemical weapons. Turn my page, bruh. They didn't focus on foreign or rogue governments. Like, getting, like, they didn't focus on, like, North Korea getting nukes. Mm. They focused on organizations like Al-Qaeda and, like, weapons smugglers and stuff like that. Like, weapons brokers. <clears throat> she works on po- uh, possibilities like missing suitcase nukes or um, a large type of martyrdom where somebody could infect themselves with a virus and just sit in a subway and just everybody that walks past them, they can get sick with this virus. It's okay. like... I guess if it was, like, Islamic extremists, that could be, like, their form of jihad. Like, you hear of, like, suicide bombers and stuff. I guess that would be another way to, like, execute that. Yeah. Just, like, infecting yourself. And later that fall, she starts the CIA field tradecraft course that specifies, specializes in things like elicitation, dead drops, bumps, brush passes, surveillance detection, like, all, like, the classic spy stuff. Yeah. Like, you pass, it doesn't look like anything happened, but you just, like, traded notes to some guy just barely, like, Moved. barely made any contact with him. So she try, she trains all throughout D.C. So this is, this is the cool part to me. This means that, like, if you're in D.C., anybody around you could be training to be a CIA, CIA operative in the streets, and you would never know. That's pretty cool. Yeah, like, they would literally run around D.C. and, like, try to do all these, like, uh, dead drops, like, which means, like, you, like... I know I don't know if they still do this, but they used to get like a file or something and make like a clay rock and just like put it on the street and like the whoever was receiving the message would know that's the rock to pick up and they just pick up the rock. Like that's hmm. they would just hide stuff in plain sight. Um so yeah, they were training all throughout DC. Um she was honing her skills in hopes of making it to the farm. I don't know if you remember what the farm is. It's that place out in Virginia where, like, the fuel operatives train to do stuff, like, in foreign countries. Okay. Like, survival, fighting, spying, all that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, her first graded assignment in D.C., when she's running around the the streets, is to find a fake uh, Kazakh man that knows about his government planning on, like, planning an attack. Um, It's all fake. So, you said it's all fake, and she has to find a Kazakh man... Like Kazakhstan, like a Kazakhstani. Yeah. Kazakh. Do you do you pick up what one I'm laying down? Borat. Yeah, fucking right. She's looking be, for Borat. It could be Borat. <laughs> <laughs> and her goal was to get a second meeting with him to try to find out what he knows. Like it's all fake. Like he, the guy she's trying to find is, she he works for the CIA, but it's all acting. Like he mm-hmm. he just needs to see how she would approach somebody, to do this like in a real like field op. So she broke the ice. She found him in a Panera Bread. She broke the ice by asking him to watch her computer while she goes to the bathroom. And she had, like, she had, like, she researched who he was and everything. So she, like, had a couple things that would pique his interest. Like, she, she had, like, That a, they'd have in common. Yeah, like a Rat, Pat, Rat Pack book. Because he's, like, he was, like, an older guy. Mm-hmm. And so they talk, they talk about, like, just stuff like the other, like, the good old days. And, like, she wishes she was, like, born, like earlier because like the rat pack and stuff yeah. she finds this stuff cool so then she makes plans to show him some rat pack like collector's items that she has and it works and then he's broke character and he was like you did well and most he said most of the new recruits just kind of like blurred out a weird conversation starter like oh nice weather we're having like looking suspicious and apparently that was like the way she did it like I guess it just that was like, the best way to do it yeah, it was more like more of an actual connection instead of just like small small mm-hmm. talk, which I get. I hate small talk. Yeah, barbers don't don't or maybe not barbers, but if I'm going to get my hair cut and it's just a stranger every time, don't don't talk to me. 
while you're getting while I'm, you're cutting my hair. Okay. That's, that's really dickish. I I don't care. I don't want to be talked to. Just ask, like you start the conversation when you're getting your hair cut. And just ask them like a weird existential question. Okay, that's a good point. <laughs> like, like how many hairs can you fit in your mouth? That's not what I meant. Oh. But I meant like, where do you go when we die? <laughs> like, that, like that kind of question. Like, do you do you believe in heaven, hell, or uh, the atriarchy? What's the atriarchy? I don't know. I just took the P off of patriarchy. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back into this before we get crazy out into the okay. weeds. So that winter, she's fast tracked to the farm. She did well, and she's going to the farm. I, I'm sorry. To... Do you know what else is called the farm? What? On Dr. Phil, that's where they send the bad kids to the farm. Oh, really? Yep. I've never heard of that. Mm-hmm. But, okay, when she's on the farm, it's technically, it's it's a fake country called um, the Republic of Britannia, or ROV. And the whole country is filled with people, news stations, an American embassy has a terrorist group that, like, blows shit up all the time. And uh, they're called the Sons of Artemis. It's like, a, it's a rogue North Korea-like state. Um... Oh, no, there's another, like, okay, they have their country, RV, they have the terrorist groups, they have their news stations, they have American embassies, and then there's another, like, enemy of this, the country called the Democratic People's Republic of Britannia, which is a complete ripoff of North Korea, Democratic People's Republic of North yeah. Korea. It's just to get them, like, training in something that feels totally real. None of the actors ever break character. Okay. Their handlers do sometimes, like, late at night when, like... They're like you did this wrong today. You did this wrong today, but barely ever. Like they're it's it's like they're living in a different country, and it's in Virginia. That that's insane to me. Yeah, like I would have never guessed anything like that existed. Yeah, like I I was just in Virginia yesterday. Were you at the farm? Uh, there was a lot of farms, like plantation, slave owning looking houses, like you know those big colonial ones, in the middle of a hundred acre field. Yeah, and Where just like, that's a good sm- spot. <laughs> just build a house. Yeah. Dude, I can't believe, like, the difference between here and down there. Because, like, uh, you know around here, like, you can see in the trees and open fields. Nothing down there, dude. The most mm. the most greenery that you can find is, like, in your backyard. What do you mean? Like, there's barely any fields. Everything is totally industrialized down there. Dude, I, we're down there and driving by. I saw a Cadillac dealership. Like, the size of a hospital. It was really? insane. Do you remember when we were in New York, we saw that, like, double-decker? And then, like, right in... The double-decker bus? No, like a um, dealership. They had, like, elevators for cars to come down. Oh, like, like the Carvana ones? No, 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 no. It was, it was like, an actual dealership. I, don't I think that's that. before Carvana got big. That okay. was in 2017. Because mm. that was you. You guys graduated. Yeah. Okay, I want to get back into it again. All right. So the CIA operatives that are teaching them, they really break character, like I said, except for little bits, tell them what they did wrong or right. They're constantly under surveillance, and they're woken up at random times for like emergencies, like if the terrorist group attacked something. She says, this is a, a direct quote from the book, it says, we're under a constant surveillance, pitted against one another, tested well beyond our limits. Sleazy instructors grope the female students in the name of preparing them for harassment in the field. Um, aging instructors shout at any student who uses the internet or, God forbid, a cell phone. Like, they'd be cut off. Because mm. some of the, sometimes in the countries you go to, you can't be using the internet and stuff. Um, they learn how to pick uh, the perfect place to meet or pick up assets, which just at the people. Um Okay. They also know how to detect and lose any surveillance that is like tailing them. That's like a big thing for them because mm-hmm. they uh, you can't be you, yeah. watched at all if you're trying to do something. She also learns a massive part of being a field operative is tons of paperwork. That's like what keeps them up at night most of the time is doing just god god strenuous god, paperwork. Just doing god work, paperwork. I don't know where I was going. Students also learn land navigation, defensive driving. Which sounds awesome. She said there is a part they've learned how to flip a car by tapping a spot right above their rear wheel with their with the front of their car. Yeah. I guess if you just like tap them and it start swerving or something and just end up flipping. I would like to know how to do that. Sometimes in the Walmart parking lot to be useful. How to they learn how to respond when swarmed by like militia fighters and 
like when they're being ambushed, I learn how to survive urban fighting and even how to save targets, like a target life. Like if you've severely wounded somebody that you don't want dead, mm. but you need like for information. <clears throat> An instructor told her good job once after one of these exercises. He said, I looked down at my target dummy. It's, it's tunic is soaked with blood and ripped from the throat to the navel. So her throat front to the belly button. Across his chest is a plastic bag with Walmart taped over his heart. And, like, you could apparently save somebody's life by taping a bag over their open wound. Because, like, Shit. she said, like, a chest sucking wound. So I don't know if that means, like, if you breathe, you can't get any air in or something. So, like, you need, like, the vacuum of your skin being there. Mm. I don't know how it works. I don't fucking know. There's just, there's just me assuming shit, like I always do. We're not doctors, men. No. <laughs> at the end of her training, a large siren suddenly blares out at. Like, all over the town, and all of the actors just get up and walk to, like walk away. Like, there's, like, storekeepers and, like, civilians and everything, and all of a sudden the alarm blares, and they're just like, oh, we're done. It'd, it'd be Is it like, a, like that episode of South Park where they went to the old, the 1876 uh, place, and they're being held hostage, the and at the end of the day, right? yeah, and at the end of the day, it's, like, 4 o'clock, and everyone just totally breaks character and up and walks out? Were the robbers in character, too? I forget. No. I do remember, I remember part of that. So after all this is over, wow, I went to a weird angle in the mic and it sounded like crazy. So it's all over and she's under non-official cover, which means she'll have, after, wait. Okay, okay. Her training ends. She gets her first assignment. She's going to be under non-official cover, which means she's going to have no diplomatic cover, no diplomatic immunity. You know what that is? Okay. Like, if you can't be arrested in another country, can you? Well, I, yeah, it's like, I know, it, they probably still do it today, but I know in the, the Cold War, there was people that, that, they technically worked at the embassy, but at night they were kind of like spies. Oh, okay. So they were diplomats, which means they couldn't be arrested for doing shady shit. Yeah. She doesn't have that. Okay. So she's going to be like, you have to be careful. So... This means she'll have no diplomatic cover since terror cells and other, like, terrorist organizations don't give a fuck. They're like, if you're from the West, you're an yeah. enemy. So, when she gets home after all this time at the farm, Anthony and all, all of his belongings are gone with a note that says they're cats at the local humane society. Like, he just left because I guess he was sick of, like, all the secrecy. Okay. So, like, they're divorced. And I'm. she said she was actually relieved. I kind of get that. Yeah, like, you don't have to worry about anyone. Like, if you don't, like, if you can't talk to them about anything, it's like, what are you doing? So, after working for a little bit more at the headquarters, she needs to find a more permanent cover. Or not, not even at the headquarters. She's, at this point, she's traveling around the world doing stuff. She's, like, she's, like, making friends, friends, air quotes, with terrorists and stuff. She needs to find a more permanent cover, one that gives a young white lady good reason to be running around the Middle East, because that's obviously going to raise some questions. Yeah. She picks the cover of being an art dealer because of the emerging art scene in those areas at the time. And also her family has a history of interest in art, like her sister went to college for art and everything, so it's like a perfect cover for her. Mm -hmm. She will now be dealing in indigenous art. So she then gets a one-of-a-kind phone from the CIA that she needs to follow, like, a very specific set of instructions on. Like, you need to click this, and then this, and then this specifically in order to communicate with headquarters from that phone. Like, you have to go through all kinds of steps just mm -hmm. to be able to communicate. With yeah. Them. So in case someone else gets it, they can't do it easy. Yeah, like, if she's, like, like um, customs or something, like, seizes her phone for some weird reason, or if she gets found out somewhere, she technically, like, there's no proof of... Unless she has, like, fucking, like, files or something on her. So, she also gets fitted for a disguise that she can use from a distance. Like, it's not it's not going to, like, pass if you're sitting as close yeah. to me. Just so she can, like, lose tails in the field. Like, if someone's following her. Mm -hmm. uh, during her trips, she's keeping contact with another CIA operative, Dean, who's working in Afghanistan. And, like, some time passes and she's working on a case with... Um, well, Dean... First of all, Dean, like... They end up getting married because okay. they're both CIA, like, like I said, like people within mm -hmm. the CIA. But uh, some time passes, and she's working on a case with a Pakistani Khan network, who's, um, I think they're, I can't, fuck, 
sounds so unprofessional. I can't remember if they were one of the arms dealers or if they're a terrorist group. But they're still one of the bad guys. Yeah, yeah. So she's working on a case with the Pakistani Khan Network who sold... Yeah, they're okay, they're arms dealers. They sold centrifuge designs and nuclear bomb parts to countries like Libya, Iran, and North Korea. So they're arms dealers. They're sending, like, nuclear components so that those countries can make nukes. Mm. So the network is in the process of being dismantled at the time. So people start talking, and some of the network say that they've been approached by groups like Al-Qaeda trying to get, like, stuff. Which is where she comes in, because she's well, the one trying to keep them. Damn. She's the one trying to keep nukes out of, like, terrorists' hands. Mm. There's also members of the Khan group that broke off and started a new network that were selling weapons to terror groups. So there's, like, all of a sudden there's, like, an explosion of terrorists trying to get nukes. She's investigating the Khan network, and she realized that the group is still intensifying the potential for nuclear terrorism. She, she thought it was, like, kind of dying off, but it, yeah. turned, it was just ramping up. And when she reports to her boss about this, she, he shows her files that they have on, like, nukes going missing and shit. And this this kind of, like, freaked me out a little bit. Um, they've had dozens of credible nuclear threats since 9-11 from terrorist groups. Obviously, we're not going to hear about that. Yeah. Unless someone writes about it like her. So, yeah. Dozens of credible nuclear terror threats, including one time where they actually had to move the vice president and a whole shadow government to an undisclosed location in case D.C. was attacked, because I guess there was a threat of D.C. being attacked. Jesus. And also, she has two new operatives working under her, so she's like the boss of two other CIA operatives who are also branching out and doing more work with more arms dealers. She's like a whole spider web of shit, like... Okay. And they're... they're yeah, they're also assessing arms dealers and trying to pose as buyers to try and stop nuclear weapons from getting into the wrong hands. So they find a perfect target... His name is Jacob from Hungary, and they use an asset in the Hezbollah, which is a Shiite terror group funded by Iran. Um, his name's Kite Wing, and I'm pretty sure he's pretty high up in the Hezbollah, so it's like really risky trying to like contact him. They introduce that guy to Jacob, so he introduces Amaryllis as a broker for the Southeastern Asian Brothers. She just needed like a generic name that sounded like something that would be real. Yeah. So they use a drafts folder in an email account. They don't want to actually send emails between each other. So they both log into the same email account and look in the drafts, and that's how they communicate with each other. So this is when Amaryllis and Jacob, the Hungarian arms dealer, start communicating. And he said before he'll talk to her about nuclear weapons, he wants to meet her in person. So they decide to meet in France. Before they meet she's following him through the streets. She doesn't want to, like, tell him a place to meet and then just be there in case, like, he yeah. comes with people. So he's, like, she found him and was just kind of, like, tailing him from a little bit of distance just to see what, like, just to, like, feel him out, I guess. Not that way. So she's following him through the streets through Lyon, France, and she hears him singing, a, like, a Hungarian, like, folk song, and she realizes that he seems more wise than he is, than he sounded from the emails. But then um, she said she looks at him, and he looks like this brute. Like, he, she said he looks like a typical, like, I don't know. She didn't say dumb, but that's kind of how I pictured it. Dumb, like, square-faced. Man. Yeah. <laughs> and she gets him to get in her car somehow, which is crazy to me. Like, I would not. Like, if I was a, a, an international arms dealer, I wouldn't just get into like, someone's car I just met. Yeah. He was apparently hesitant, but, like, he decided to get in. So she starts pushing him about more effective weapons, like hinting at nukes. And, like, he has a cover that he only sells, like, ordinary military surplus. Like, I have, like, guns and, like, mm -hmm. armored vests or whatever. And she can tell that he's, like, getting pushed, like, kind of past his comfort zone. And when she pushes him a little bit farther, he says, I don't, I don't think I know what you mean. You can drop me here. So he's like, yeah, I'm done with this. So she let him go. She goes back to D.C. to tell her boss what happened. But then he tells her that Jacob, when she was, like, traveling, I guess, left a message in the drafts folder saying that he has something that might fit the bill. So, like, she, she thought she fucked everything up. And yeah. She's kind of back in business now. She tells him she found another seller, but she'd come back if she needed anything later. She's, like, playing, like, the game of, like, we don't need you. Like, mm -hmm. 
Like you, like like I can find anyone else. Like you need me more than I need you. Yeah. So a few weeks later, and then another month later, he reaches out again. They they still don't answer him. Just they they think that he's getting desperate for money. So they can't think of what to do with Jacob at the time. That would make the world safer. Like they couldn't automatically try to flip him because they don't have his like mutual respect or trust yet. And if they the way the brokerages are set up for weapons apparently like if you buy it he expects to see it on the market for a higher price you, like you selling it to someone else because you're not the group that's buying the weapons to use you're just another broker okay so they can't just start buying weapons because if they don't see like if he doesn't see the weapons on the market to be resold he's gonna get like get suspicious mm. so shit where was that I, I took my eyes off my page for like a minute Okay, okay, yeah. So, a few months later, she arranges a meeting with him again at a hotel room on the coast of Tunisia. I think that's... Is that Africa? Tunisia? I have no clue. I can't... I'm probably so far off. But he arrived at the meeting again. He was singing again, walking through the hotel hallways. Uh, they started talking about anything. Just, like, not business. They don't want to talk mm-hmm. business immediately. And she brought up a ring that she saw in his hand. It had a lamb on it. And he said it was his grandfather's who had been killed by the communist government in Hungary. And he said it reminded him not to go soft. She's going to use this later to, like, flip him. Okay. Uh, she tells him that she's in this business, arms dealing, to give weapons to all sides so that all sides have voices. Like, I guess her cover story is that she wants to sell weapons to people who don't have the weapons so that they're not just being taken advantage of the countries that do have them. Okay. Like they all have an equal voice because they all have the nuclear deterrent. Mm. Um, so then he laughs at this and says, mother Teresa, the arms broker. Well, don't let me stand in your way. What what can I do for you? So now she's in business. Uh, she starts building rapport with him and to like to eventually try to turn him. He starts lift, like listing off what he has and she doesn't know much. She doesn't have much interest until he mentions beryllium reflectors, which is what most terrorist organizations would want for nuclear weapons, because I guess it's the easiest way to actually detonate one. They're, they don't need, like, the factories and, like, the labs to detonate it. Okay. Oy. So after this meeting, she cables back to headquarters. Everything Jacob told her that he had for sale, she tells them. This was also useful to know... Um, what they could buy to keep out of Tara's hands like now until they like build more trust with him mm-hmm. just so they can't get weapons because like that's their that's their whole goal is to keep wep- like nukes out of yeah. Tara's hands so she plans to use the story of Jacob's grandfather to try to get him to turn and help the world become a safer place like once she feels he's ready so she travels back to DC after this meeting and they start working Jacob had mentioned he had contacts who used to work at um, Arzimaz 16 which was the most technologically advanced Soviet era nuclear lab like in Russia mm. and this also freaked me out um, they produced bombs such as like suitcase nukes that were like carryable uh, they could get past like airline check like airline checks shit dude uh, these bombs could turn a whole city uninhabitable like it's like it's like this big but like with all the fallout and everything yeah it's like, um, yeah and it's believed that 150 to 200 are still missing from the Soviet arsenal. So they're just fucking, like, floating out there yeah. somewhere. Holy That's shit, That's the part dude. that freaked me out. Like, like, what if they're in, like, Pennsylvania? Yeah. Like, so, in the meantime, she has to meet with Karim, who is an Al-Qaeda asset that hates Americans, but is only working with them because he's trying to stop Al-Qaeda from getting nukes. And this, this is, like, a, uh, this came out of left field. Like, this wasn't one of her assets, but some... Some, the guy that was handling him in the CIA just, like, quit unexpectedly, so it fell into her hands. Mm-hmm. So they met in herbal Iraq, and when they meet, he said he was like, I have five minutes. Like, I like I think he traveled with one of his other Al-Qaeda guys, and, like, he didn't want to be suspicious. He was like, I need to, like, say what I need to say, and I need to get out of here. Mm-hmm. So he says his Chechen contact for nuclear material, he had, like, a, an, a dealer in che- uh, Chechnya, he went quiet and he didn't know if he was like caught or killed or what but his commander wanted him to find someone new and his commander also thought that he may have had something to do with him going missing so if he didn't find someone else he was probably going to be killed mm-hmm. 
so he's very urgent. It didn't seem, it seemed like his life was in danger, which it, it was. Yeah. Like, this is just what she saw until he, like, told her that. And if he didn't leave with a new dealer, he would probably be killed. So she's, like, she was like, she didn't want to set him up with another actual arms dealer. But if she wants to keep him alive to be their informant, she needs to. Yeah. So she set him up with Jacob. So that way, if he does sell to him, they can also try to keep it out of Al-Qaeda's hands. Like, it'll be harder to do, but it's better to have them... I know what you mean. Like, it's better to to try and keep them out of his hands than have no asset in Mm Al-Qaeda. Man. Even reading these notes, it's confusing to me. So she turn, she quickly gives him an email that she'll communicate with him on to set him up with Jacob drafts folder like before. So shortly after this, to make the operation look like it was like a, like I had no ties to the U.S. because she was under the cover of being the art dealer. Yeah. Um, she gets moved to Shanghai in China. Uh, she's to set up an Asian office and to look for like emerging artists in the Middle East. That's her cover story. She has to expect constant surveillance and she isn't allowed to conduct any operations in China because we're not really friends. Yeah. And if they find out CIA is doing something, I mean, like, they have to expect it, but, like, to actually have proof of if it, they find it would it, not be good. That's fucked. Yeah. It's only to be used as a home base for her art business. So before she leaves, her boyfriend, Dean, who was the guy in Afghanistan who's also CIA, they get married so that they can both be in China because if they didn't, they wouldn't be allowed to have contact with each other at all for like six years because that's how long she was going to be over there. Mm -hmm. And that's where I stopped for this. So next episode, I'll have the rest of the book. It'll be all finished up. All right. It It took way longer than I expected to research a book. So yeah, it's a cool story, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's certainly interesting. It's confusing. Because there's, like, so many... It's like a fucking spider web of... Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool, though. That's all I got. Honky. All right. Honky tonk. Woman. (laughs) Okay. So, um... I have a question. Yeah. What's Operation Barney? Oh. I'm glad you asked. My ear is so itchy right now. It's deep in the canal, and I can't get my finger in it. Deep in the canal? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, take my pen jam that mother in there I don't want to do that I really don't oh fine Mr. My shit doesn't smell it doesn't stink it doesn't smells. stink it has a smell but it doesn't stink alright so after America entered World War 2 the Japanese sunk the USS Wahoo which I know it's a silly sounding name Wahoo it sounds like something Mario would say I know uh, right after well not right after we joined the war but it was like maybe a year later and uh, so when it went down, it had 79 men and no one survived. So it took everyone down with it. And Charles Lockwood, uh, who was the submarine fleet commander, wanted payback for the sinking. However, we weren't pre- prepared to go into the Sea of Japan and strike uh, around the area where the U.S. Wahoo went down. Wait, so did Japan sink it? Yes. Is that like a sub or something or what? I think there was, I was, it was a minefield. And I'll get into the minefield yeah. later. Okay. Uh, many submarines didn't have the proper equipment to maneuver around the minefield in the in the waters, and it took two years later for experimental U.S. submarines to inflict retribution uh, by striking at Japanese merchant ships, which were extremely useful to the Japanese because at the time I I, I don't know if they're, st- they're still not doing it now, but uh, they couldn't make their own oil; it was only imported from where do you know? Uh, I know we used to import there, like, in the 20s, I think. We definitely stopped that, though. Oh, yeah, yeah, no doubt about that. But, uh... I wonder if Germany... Did Germany have their own oil, or did they import it, too? Um... Because they were I feel allies. like Germany was a... And especially, like, World War Two Germany, I feel like they were probably big enough to have pretty much everything they needed. I guess that was, like, the, at the peak of, like, imperialism, so, like, the big countries had stuff everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. But I also, wait, but I would also think Germany would, like, be like, yeah, we weren't using all this for ourselves. Do you know that Germany got uh, cars from Ford, or trucks from Ford? <coughs> in World, World War II? II? Yep. 
Wait, what? Yeah, How? Henry Ford sent uh, trucks over to Hitler in World War Two. Why? Makes me kind of lot. Yeah, I think like, he uh, thought Adolf was a good fella. It makes me not like Henry Ford. Yeah, That's but hey, shitty. but uh, hey, Mustang's a Mustang. You can't turn that mother down. Anyway, uh, when Japan entered the war. They lined the Pacific all the way from China to Australia with mines in order to keep enemy ships Holy and U-boats out. Yeah, And uh, at the beginning of the war, Japan had a ton of merchant ships to keep them supplied with oil, like I said earlier, uh, which they didn't produce. Real quick. Yes. Do you think any of those mines are like still floating out there? Like a stray mine or two that just like didn't get picked up at the end? I mean, I've seen, like I've heard of like... Uh, like mines, not sea mines, but like on land or like and like undetonated artillery shells. Yeah, there was one found on the beach I think a few years ago, like a bomb from World War Two. It might have been at Normandy. That uh, <laughs> that'd be likely. Yeah. Well, that'd be likely at like I guess any any beach that there was fighting. Yeah, but that one was so like that was a crazy one. Yeah. Some would say it was uh, a pro gamer move. What was that look for? <laughs> Toward the end of the war, uh, they lost so many ships that they could only operate in a small area because they didn't have enough forces to protect it. And uh, U.S. soldiers would taunt the Japanese by calling it Hirohito's bathtub. Which, for those of you who don't know, Hirohito was the emperor of Japan at, during World War Two. And uh, I heard he was quite the puss. They the first time anyone heard his voice that like wasn't part of like the upper circle was whenever they surrendered. I heard a podcast about him. And apparently, like, he was always kind of like a fuck-up. And then in the end <laughs> of the war, he just kind of ran away and was, like, moving through house to house, just, like, trying to stay away from Allied troops. Because, like, after the war ended, we were on, we were yeah. in Japan. And then, they, I guess the troops closed in on him. And you know how, like, it's... um. It was, like, their thing, like, if you disgraced your family, you, you like, killed yourself with your sword. Well, he he didn't use the sword. He shot himself, but he couldn't even fucking kill himself. He he still lived. Like, he didn't even kill himself, right? I'm sorry. You're I just, fine. I, I heard that. I, I thought it was Hirohito. Um, there's a picture of him and Nixon. Like, he welcomed him to America. What? I'm pretty... If you Google that... I'm pretty sure you can find it. Here, Hito and Nixon. I'll Google it when you keep going. All right. Uh, so from 1941 to 1943, but really 41 for like not even a month because, you know, Pearl Harbor, December 7th, uh, American submarines were very uh, problematic and many of them were the result of defective torpedoes, uh, which was incredibly dangerous for the crews because if, if you have a torpedo that's stuck in the tube... Obviously, you have a chance of it detonating, and you can't fire out of that that tube, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, So the crews were also very underprepared, resulting in a loss of a lot of submarines and sailors because they didn't know how to defend themselves. Did you find something? Yeah, I'll go into it when you're done. Okay. Um, However, as the war progressed, uh, we worked out the kinks, and we started to sink more and more Japanese merchant ships. And by 1943... Uh, we had sunk 180 ships in the Pacific, but that was not enough to win the war. To give a comparison, uh, like the Nazis, their submarine fleet sunk 180 ships in two months. It took us a year to sink 180 ships. Damn, boy. I know. So I I couldn't understand this guy, how he said it or spelled it. Uh, this was on Dark Docks, by the way. Uh, I think his name was Ernest Kingst. Uh, he came up with a new strategy in April of 1943 uh, to send small submarine fleets into the mine and festive waters in order to sink more ships. So they wanted to sneak in and then just have them sit there and wait for ships to go by, I think. And just kind of like shoot as they go past? Yeah. And on October 11th, the USS Wahoo was attacked by Japanese forces and sank while out on patrol. And... Uh, in its time in the Pacific, it had sank 20 Japanese ships and was very well respected. It was considered our like our Pacific Fleet's best ship, or our best uh, submarine, excuse me. So was it, like, respected by the Japanese? No, no, I like, mean, like, among, among our guys. Okay. I didn't know if it was, like, one of those, like, 
it's our enemy, but like it's a good enemy. Yeah, I think it feels one of those things. Um, so the sinking of the USS Wahoo uh, made many other crews not want to venture out into the waters anymore because you know they lost their best ship and we're not like they were thinking like, oh man, like we're not even nearly as good as that, and yeah, they got the, sunk. The best ship got sunk. Like, What's gonna happen to us? Yeah, and uh, Charles Lockwood said that the sinking was the greatest loss that they had ever had. And he wrote that they would exact a, quote, hour of revenge, which I thought sounded pretty badass. Mm. And uh, he called for upgrades uh, for U.S. subs and went to the University of California uh, where he saw all kinds of technology that students in the defense department, I think that's what it was, uh, they'd been working on to try and help the war effort. And, like, you know, uh, experimental stuff. That he just wanted to see what what was going on. And he called, or uh, never mind. Uh, one thing he was he was shown was a detector that was based off of uh, sonar that could pick up things like ships, submarines, rocks, sea life, and mines from up to seven hundred yards away. So that's that's kind of far. Was it like big sea life, was it like shrimp? They pick up shit all the time. Like, um, I think it'd be like whales and sharks and bigger things like that. Like Nemo. Yeah, Nemo, and uh, so. Uh, this was the FM sonar, and it was tested and installed on Navy subs, but it wasn't installed for a little while. And he knew that wolf packs of these new submarines could infiltrate Japanese waters, but uh, lots of the Navy heads, like the higher ups, they thought that sonar was too new. Like it was, it was a, uh, I don't know how to say it, but it wasn't known as well. Do you, like do you they, know what I'm trying to say? Like, they didn't trust it because it was still new? Yeah, like, yeah, they didn't trust it. And uh, by April of 1945, uh, more and more submarines were being fitted with these FM sonar, like, detectors. And a group of subs uh, were called Hellcats. And I found out whenever, uh, like, you know if you see a submarine movie or any Navy movie, and it has, like, the little sweepy thing, and it'll do, like, the boom... Boom. And like it'll the little yeah, like the little, one picks that up. Those are called Hell's Bells. Oh, okay. I just thought that was kind of cool. I think and that's what the ACD six songs about. Maybe ship sonar. Uh, but a group of these were called the the Hellcats and had gone to the. Uh, this was also hard to get. Uh, Sashima Strait on June fourth, the first one that was leading, the the Hell's Cats. Mm. Uh, and the first sub named the Sea Dog was picking up dozens of mines as it slowly made its way through. So they're like, they're just creeping through it and all of these mines are like just all around them. And they found every mine was 50 yards apart, which that's not a whole lot of space. No, for a giant sub. Yeah. And uh, so being 50 yards apart, it made it very difficult because if there's one in your way, like... Yeah, and it's probably pretty hard to maneuver those things. Like, yeah, around getting turn and back and missing the next fifty yard mine. That's that's got to be pretty hard. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the co- or one of the subs came so close to a uh, or a mine that they they scraped the rope holding it to the sea floor. Fuck, dude. And like the whole the whole ship or the whole sub their crew could hear it dragging along the side. I bet their assholes were so clenched. Like, oh my god, dude. Like, it probably hurt for a day or two <laughs> afterwards. And, uh, it, their sonar, uh, it, it picked up mines that were centimeters away from them. Fuck. They were that close, dude. Like, a centimeter is what? Like, two, two centimeters is one inch. Something like that, yeah. So, pretty much inches away. Yeah. That's fucking crazy. And it's not like a car where you can just look out your window. Yeah, but you're in a fucking submarine in the dark. They don't have windows. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they have some windows. Don't, don't they have, like, a periscope? Yeah, but and then that's, like, I if thought, you're all... That's, I think, if you're only, like, close to the surface. I thought the rest was just up to the instruments on board. I don't know. You're probably right, but I thought there was, like, portholes and stuff. Like, you can't open them, obviously, but... I don't know. I... I guess I just assumed they didn't because of pressure and stuff. Yeah, you're so, probably right. I don't, I'm probably wrong. Um, but so they made it where they were trying to go and, uh, they were there for 20 days and they sank 28 merchant, uh, Japan, 28 merchant ships, a Japanese destroyer and accidentally sank a Russian ship because, uh, 
the war in Germany was over at this point. Or, like, it was just starting to be over, because... Oh, Hitler, so this was, like, towards the end? Yeah, it was... A, this is 1945, April 1945, and Hitler is either about to kill himself or has just killed himself. Because he killed himself April 30th, I think. I can't remember the exact... I think it's April 30th. Because his birthday is April 20th. And I, want, I wonder if Russia was, like, eager to go fight Japan, because they have a long history of, like, hating each other. I, I don't know, but, uh... We we blamed the Japanese Navy because obviously it wouldn't look good if one of our subs sank oh, a Russian oh, ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. While well, we're still allies anyway. I mean, friendly fire happens. Yeah, but not when you are dealing with a it's giant fine. communist nation. But uh, uh, one there's on so they sunk like twenty eight ships, and uh, one submarine had been sunk on the way back. It it struck a mine, and. Uh, they were going back to Pearl Harbor, and they had lost every man on board. But Charles Lockwood, he had been there to congratulate them. And uh, what was it? April, May, June, July, August. Four months later, we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mm-hmm. ending the war. But damn boy, what you doing there? I don't know. I always love the World War Two stories, dude. Yeah. Like, the size of their, like, balls. <laughs> Massive, Fucking, dude. Like, I don't know how they walked. Like, if they, were, if they were equivalent to boobs, they'd be, like, wearing what? Triple Zs? Yeah, triple Zs. To, like, to, to steer a submarine inches away from a mine, like, through a minefield, like yeah. a maze of mines. That's insane. Oh, and when you were talking about the sonar not being trusted, that reminded me. I forget. I think it's on... Did you watch that, like, back in school? Did they ever show you... Uh, it's called America, the Story of Us. That sounds familiar. And it was... I, they showed us, like, throughout high school, they showed us a World War II episode, like, four or five times. And I remember... I can't, I can't remember the exact details, but it was something like there was a truck on Hawaii... It was a radar truck, and radar was still new, and they saw a bunch of these blips coming in, and they just kind of disappeared, so they didn't think anything of it. And then the next thing you know, Pearl Harbor was attacked. So, like, the, what they were seeing was the planes, but they were just like... Eh. Oh, yeah, I've heard that, dude. There was uh, a station, I think it was, like, up in, like, the mountains, like, around Pearl Harbor, and they they saw it, but they didn't do anything. Cause they thought like, it was just... They thought it was just... Like a flock of birds or something. I heard they thought it was just uh, our aircraft just coming back in from a test or uh, like just practice. Can you imagine that hot-headed feeling? You see that (laughs) disappear and you get the call, Pearl Harbor's being bombed. You go, oh, what? Oh. Oh, I didn't see anything. That's crazy. (laughs) You better ask Jim. I think he saw something. (laughs) I'm not the boss. Passing the buck. Passing the The buck. The first defense of the timid and weak. I did find about Nixon. Okay. Um, it said December 20, September 26, 1971, President Richard Nixon welcomed Japan's Emperor Hirohito. I didn't know he lived that long. I thought he died. Um, they welcomed him to the United States for what was the first meeting in the history between the Emperor of Japan and the President of the United States. Wait, so was he still Emperor after... I f- think... I think... No fucking way. I think they kept him in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up. Emperor Hirohito. Um, pa- uh, power after World War Two. Okay. Or just look up his... Uh, his. How long was Emperor... Or Hirohito Emperor? Emperor of Japan from t- 1926 until his death in 1989. Holy shit. Damn. He was fucking old. I mean, he fucking looks old in this picture, dude. dude. Even Stalin, he died in like the fifty. Or well, he died when uh, Johnny Cash was in the army. That was like nineteen fifty three, nineteen fifty four. Was it Stalin that had like such bad stress that like, when he died, they said that if they tapped his vein, it would fucking like shatter. What? There's something I can't remember if it was Hitler or Stalin, but he had some weird thing. Well, it, it was. It it had to be Stalin. Because Hitler was burned, burned oh, yeah, outside yeah. his bunker. They said there's something I can't remember if it was like stress related from like blood pressure, but they said his veins, 
and stuff were like they they were so hard that you could like tap it and it was like it would shatter like ice. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Well, he's probably on a fuck ton of drugs too. I don't know if that'd do it, but I don't know. He was super paranoid about everybody, even like his inner circle. Yeah. Um, fuck, what was it? I when I think it was when he had a stroke. Like he had a stroke before he died, and he lived through it. But like he was very adamant about like don't come into my room and wake me up, and it was like hours into the day, which was normal. He would get up later during the end, of, like towards the end of his life. And there's always like guards outside his door, and he like they didn't hear anything for hours after like his usual wake up time, and they're like we don't want to go in because we're gonna be like fucking killed for waking mm-hmm. him up. And I think one of his, like, higher-ups who wanted his seat of power were, like, you need to go in there and check on him. Mm-hmm. They, like, went in, and he was, like, fucking, like, on the floor. Uh, like, I don't even know where I was going with that. <laughs> so did he, did he survive that one, or is that when he died? I, he survived it, and I think a couple of days later he died. Okay. I can't, I can't quite remember. I, I heard that a while ago. I think I told this story before on here, but... I just thought this was kind of cool. Johnny Cash was the first American to know Hitler, or not Hitler, uh, Stalin was dead. How? He was working... He was the first American? Yep. <laughs> not even a president? Well, well, he was in the Air Force. Johnny Cash was? Yep. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was in the Air Force before he like recorded all his music and stuff. Huh. And uh, he, I think he started from like 53 to 55, I think. But uh, anyway, he was listening to... Uh, like radio messages like radio from Radio Moscow or whatever. Uh, no, not Radio Moscow, but like, like coded messages that it's, was going on between. Something's happening with the mic. Russia, and uh, he found out that Hitler or not. God damn! I keep saying Hitler. Um, that Stalin was dead, and he went to his like his like commanding officer. He's like, "Hey, Stalin's dead." <laughs> Fuck. I I just thought that was like hey, pretty this cool. This guy's dead. He's gone. Donezo. He's dead. He's gone. Forever. They killed him. What was that South Park thing? It's like, and then you'll die. Forever. I don't remember that. I, can't rem- I think it was the Imagination Land episode. One of those ones. Where, like, the terrorists attack everyone's imaginations. I didn't really like that. those episodes. I fucking loved them. That and, like, the one where Cartman freezes himself. I didn't like that one either. That was like one of my favorite episodes, and I would watch it all the time, like when I was big into South Park. Mm-hmm. I'd constantly be watching it. I feel like one of my favorite episodes is the where they made fun of High School Musical, but that is because that was the first episode I ever watched. What was the dad's name on that? Uh, Mister or Br- Mister Queermo. Or yeah, Mister Queermo. <laughs> ba bow, ba bow, ba bow. Slapping you, slapping you, silly. Because they disrespected me. And uh, there's one part where uh, CPS comes to take away his son, Bryden, or Brian or whatever, and uh, he's slapping these these uh, CPS agents, CPS. and they're going to their car, and the neighbor is standing outside, and he goes, What are you looking at, Jonathan? And it goes to him slapping him real quick and just shutting the door and going back in his house. <laughs> Bitch slapping everybody. <laughs> oh shit, son! How long are we even? It's it's uh, ten till ten right now. Holy shit, dude! Well, we've probably been going at it for like an hour now. You think? We're at sixteen hundred bars. Well, I always forget to set a timer. We started a little bit after eight forty. Uh, I give it nine o'clock. We started. Yes, it's a good fifty minutes. Yeah. Dude, I didn't I realize we're going for that long. Holy shit! Me either. Damn. I really want to watch that Space Odyssey movie. Mm-hmm. Just a little uh, trivia. They played that song before Elvis's Aloha in Hawaii concert. What? The 2001 Space Odyssey theme song. I don't even know. I don't think I know the theme song. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum. That's from Space Odyssey. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 Oh, God. I, I do not like that noise. All right. We got to get a sheer wine hiss this episode. Did we do that last time or was that time before? Uh, one of them. I don't know. 
Or we <laughs> We were finally getting to the amount of podcasts where they start all blending together. Like I can't remember which one's which. Yeah. I can barely remember what three was ago, like three ago. Mm-hmm. I'm I want I want to get to the triple digits. I want to get to a hundred. It's gonna take like another year. No, I'm not in not a year. Yeah, we're at forty two right now, dude. We've been doing yeah, it for but we over sh- a year. Yeah, but we skipped out for like three or four months. Well, think if we do it every week this year, which I'm sure there'll be one or two that we can't. Yeah. Which because there was last year, fifty two. Forty two plus fifty two. Okay. It's yeah. Mathematically. Unless we start doing more, like more than one a week, like Dumpster. if we start just doing the one like shoot the shit for an hour. Yeah. Which I like doing that. Some of those are fun. Funk. Trying to find some cool news shit. I would, but phone's recording. Yeah, I get it. Whatever. Yeah. I saw. I showed you that they like found a new type of physics. Mm-hmm. But I didn't read it yet, because I'm not ready to like hurt my head. <laughs> Yeah, boy. So what's what's been up with you lately, bro? Not much. Just been doing a lot of nothing. How was Virginia? It was good. I went and visited my aunt and cousin and uncle in Virginia. Virginia. <laughs> Down in Virginia? Yeah. They live near, like, D.C., right? Like, maybe a half hour outside of D.C. Nice. We've only... I think we've only been to D.C. like three times ever. Or at I'm, least I have. I've never gone. It was, it was pretty cool. I drove the Beltway... Going to the beach once, but that's not like, yeah, through it. It's just yeah. like, that's meant to be the quick way around it. That's how it was. Uh, whenever my pap and dad and I went to Memphis, you have to go around, like I mean, literally around Nashville. Mm. All the cities or like all the buildings are over here, and we just did this, and it just kept straight going through to Memphis. And even then, it was like four hours away. And when I saw the Memphis, like, there was Memphis signs everywhere, like, on the highway. I was like, mm. oh, man, we must be getting closer. Four fucking hours later. It's like Memphis, 500 miles. <laughs> well, it, it wasn't one of those signs. Like, I know what you mean on the side of the road. Mm. Like, it was, like, one of the ones above, like, Memphis, this exit. And I was like, oh, we must be getting close. No. Yeah. No, <laughs> it was four hours. That sucked ass, dude. I mean, it was, it was fun getting there, I guess. But... Yeah, I read an entire book on the way there. You can I can't I cannot read in the car. I'll get sick. I don't know how you can do that. I was I was extremely bored, dude. My was phone it, was almost dead. Was it about Memphis? It was about Elvis. Nice. That was the whole reason we were going down there, or big reason we were going down there. We can give Eric an afro. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like one of those uh, Russian hats. You know what I mean? The big ones. The big fur yeah, yeah. hats and a big fur jacket kind of like the uh what's the guard around buckingham palace in england uh kind of looks like is it, that's not the imperial guard is it no, something no, something imper- it I'm sounds probably, like something japanese imperial I guard i'm referencing star wars actually but, oh dude we need to go to like pittsburgh more we went last weekend the best tacos i've had in my entire fucking life where it's called Condado's Tacos. It's in uh, Lawrenceville. Okay. It's like uh, 10 minutes out of... You know the strip district's at? It's like 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes away from there. Yeah. Dude. I've never heard of a brisket taco. It blew my... It blew... Blew my goddamn mind. Whenever we went to the... I don't know if you remember this, but Terry, Trazer, and... Uh, uh, but Was it the World of Wheels thing? Yes. Who's the other one that went with us? Is it Tyler? Tyler, yeah. He went with us. Um, We went to... It was at the David L. Lawrence Convention Center, and we were hungry, and it was like probably like 8.30, maybe 9 o'clock, so it was dark out, and we just started walking, and it started raining, and one of the first places we found... I, I can't remember what it was called, but it was really good, dude. I'm what, sure if you ask Terry about it, he'll remember. What kind of food was it? Um... What was a bar? Like, it just it was just, like, all, like, all around stuff. Like, I think I got, like, cheese sticks and pizza, maybe. And I, I, I don't remember what the other guys got, but it was pretty good. It was it was really cool. Like, the building was cool. 
Oh, dude, I have to show you because uh, I can't show you now. There's um, this building. The whole side was painted. It was okay. like a city scene, dude. It looked like someone took a fucking picture and put it on the side of the building. It was really? incredible, like reflections and everything from like tail lights on the ground from cars and shit. It was it's, oh, it was cool, inc- it was amazing. It was, like it had to have taken so long to do. Did you see uh at our beach, or, Carolina or Beach? Her. What? Uh, did you see at Carolina Beach? They uh, they posted this on their Instagram the other day. They got a sign like a mural painted, and it's supposed to look like those old postcards from like the fifties. It says "Welcome to Carolina Beach." Oh. They got one of those. It actually looks pretty that good, dude. Pretty cool. Yeah, I did not see that. I didn't. Does Carolina Beach like as the town? They have an Instagram page. Mm-hmm. I I'll think they have one. At maybe two. I'll have to follow that. Yeah, I didn't know they had that. Mm-hmm. But it, it looked really good. I'm so excited to go back. Me too. Dude. I want some flaming Amy's. Mom decided she'd be a fucking joker yesterday, and uh, sent me a picture because yesterday was April Fool's Day, and. I got some of my other family, but I didn't think that she would play such a dastardly trick. She sent me a, a screenshot. It looked like it was off of Facebook, and it said that burnt or uh, Brit's donuts had burnt down to the ground. And I was like, "Who wants to fucking die?" I would walk out into the street and shoot myself in the head if that was the case. And uh, I sent back, "Who who wants to fucking die?" <laughs> and, or uh, she said, whenever she sent it, she was like, uh, mo- "No point in going to the beach anymore," and. And then she sent a Dunkin' Donuts gif with uh, April Fools on the inside. I'm like, uh-huh. I said, "Surfs up, ass hat." Dude, anybody listening? If you love glazed donuts, you need to make a trip to Carolina Beach. Yeah, if you're anywhere around Wilmington, North Carolina. If you're in California, yeah, just just pop, peep, drip, drip these, uh, drip these donuts. Those donuts by themselves, like by themselves, by. By themselves. That donut by itself. By Byzantine Empire. Wait. What? <laughs> but, like, the donuts are worth a five-day trip. They are so fucking yeah. good. And they're, they make they're, them right in front of you. Yep. They're, like, it's not like they're made and then just sent there, like, you know, warmed or whatever. Like, they make it right in front of you. Dude, I think it was the year before Mom got married. Uh, they stood in line for... What was it like an hour and a half just to get I these donuts? Because they're only open on Saturdays or I Mondays. I think once the like the the, the off season. Yeah, we we always go in like September, October. So it's like right after the big like summer rush. So yeah, it's like stuff starting to close down for the season. But they're only open one day, and people love them so much. Like, and it's right on the boardwalk too. So obviously, there's gonna be a lot of be people around. But, and I'm not like, I'm not one. Like, if I see donuts, I'm not one to just go, like, grab a donut. I'm not, like, a giant donut person. Fuck my ass, dude. Those are such... They're to kill for. Yeah. They're to literally kill for. And how you're how you're saying you can't wait for Flaming Amy's? Did you get a banana Elvis this year? I yeah, thought you I, did. It was, like... That's one of the times where, like, something's so hyped up. Like, it, I... I don't want to like a dick, but, like, I had higher expectations of it, though. Okay. Well, their burritos are fucking phenomenal. I kind of, I kind of know what you mean. I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but like whenever I was reading it, I thought it was gonna be served like with ice cream on top of it and all the, all the pickings. I but mean, it probably would be if there was like actually in restaurant. But since it was all yeah. takeout, yeah. I, I'm not. I guess I'm not gonna complain that much. But whenever we got there, we went there like t- three or four times there while we were down times there. This year, yeah, and. They set your food out on the curb. Like, literally the, out yeah. on the curb. In the summer heat. So And it was like, what, 80, 90 degrees out every day? Yeah. So that ice cream, A, a anything cold was going to be hot instantly. And anyone could fucking take it. Yeah, that's... Like, you paid over the phone. You didn't, you were, no one was allowed to go inside. Only yeah. the people working there. Give them, like, your card number over the phone and yep. everything. It's worth it. But, uh... The burritos. Anyway, I, I thought, I got the banana Elvis. And, uh, for those of you who don't know... Elvis always ate like peanut butter banana sandwiches, like fried peanut butter banana sandwiches. And so what they did is they took uh, peanut butter, but pe- pe- fuck, peanut butter and chocolate chips, peanut butter, and uh, a banana, like sliced up bananas, and put them in a tortilla. It was some weird wrap. I get. Do they deep fry it? Yeah, they deep fry this tortilla wrap. Like they wrap it up, deep fry it, and then 
it came with vanilla ice cream and chocolate syrup. And, like, chocolate chips. Yeah. Did it come with whipped cho- cream? No, it didn't come with whipped cream. But I think the chocolate chips were already in there. It I was, thought I had a cup of chocolate chips. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But I, I, I thought it was pretty good. Uncle Scott, I think he thought it was good, too. He, he got, what, two of them, I think, all the way down there. Yeah, he got Two or three of them. Yeah, like, like, I thought they were good, but they weren't, like... To die for. Yeah, the burritos, on the other hand. Those are awesome. What's, got, what's your favorite thing down there? At Flaming Amy's, not the beach. At Flaming Amy's? Yeah. Uh, they have, like, it's the hottest burrito on their menu. Both times I got it, it was amazing. It was the last time I got it, I was, like, kind of disappointed because I didn't think it was, it was hot. I guess all the hot settled at the bottom, like, all the... Oh, sauce. I remember that, yeah. In the bottom, like, third, it was just, like, <laughs> hell on earth, but it was so good. I'm a, I'm a slut for some spice. Uh, what was the pizza place that we went to? Michelangelo's? Michelangelo's. Dude, they have the best I'm fucking pizza. That. Really? It's it's just average to me. My best pizza on earth is Gino's, in my opinion. Here. I don't know. I love Gino's. I think Papa John's can make a good fucking pizza. Oh, okay, so are we doing are we doing na- so if like it's a like mom and pop shop? Okay, mom and pop. What's your favorite? Uh, Pappy's Pappy's Pizza, dude. Where's that? Up in Johnstown. My dad and uh, my stepmom and I we used to go there all the time when I was little, dude. I mean the the place is a fucking dump, but they. Wow. Can, That's I'm being honest, dude. Like, it probably has been like updated since like maybe like 1980 but that's that's what gives it character yeah but boy can they make a good fucking pizza and they make it right in front of you too like everything like they like they you can watch them like toss the dough and all that like they have glass just so you can watch them do all like everything oh man dude when i was seven i could easily put away like seven or eight slices it was that good damn dude and they were big they're big slices too like they're probably like the size of your head probably that big and the pizzas themselves were like oh shit almost the width of the table like probably from from here to your arm mm. like and it was a circle but god damn dude they make a good pizza do you remember beside the beside GameStop in Latrobe there used to be yeah. that neighborhood pizza yeah I think they had, they had a pizza. I think they called that pizza the neighborhood. Fucking massive! It was lo- It was bigger than this table. The slices were seriously like this big. Like I've only I've only over, been there like one time. Over a foot long, slices. I don't know why they shut down, dude. That place was awesome. I heard, uh, we never ate there because I thought Mom always said that. I thought she didn't like it. I mean, she she might have. We just it's still like a half hour away from our house, but. I don't, I don't know what it is with pizza places there, but that same, because it's like a, it's like a building that has like four different businesses in it, yeah, like a little strip mall type thing. Yeah, that that one building that like the one section that has the pizza place, Always. it's gone through like four different pizza places. They all shut down. Yeah, I don't get it. Well, it's like a like some of those gas stations or something. Like you can all like it seems like someone's always buying something, like buying it and like then trying to do it, something. Like a but different the, sign up. Yeah, it just turns to shit and they have to sell it again. I just I wonder why that place is like the worst destination. I don't know. Maybe it's cursed. Unpopular opinion. I am a, I'm also a whore for uh, Pizza Hut. Yeah, that's a very unpopular opinion. I fucking love Pizza Hut. Their stuffed crust pizza. There's Boy. a reason that they took it out of Le Trobe Joffrey. It's almost as good as the school's stuffed crust pizza. You don't like the schools either? No. When I was in school, oh my god. Well, I should say when I was in like elementary school. Yeah, because Michelle Obama hadn't ruined school lunches yet. Yeah, I don't. I never really understood what the point of that was. It was to get us to eat healthier, but then they're like, "Oh, instead of serving the the good like stuff crust, we'll we'll serve you like a burnt piece that's dry." <laughs> I guess like oh, uh, have less moisture in it. Is that what? Yeah. Is that what their goal was pretty accurate. They, yeah, they'd sell you like chocolate milk, a piece of like brick pizza. <laughs> And then, like, a fruit cup, and they're like, you're healthy now. <laughs> Diabetes, gone. Diabetes, gone. Famine. Diabetes, bit damn you. 
Di- diabetes, damn you. We're just going to starve you. Science be praised. <laughs> What's that? There was a weird business that came into our school. They had, like, air quote chefs come in. Oh, I remember that. Their, their stuff was pretty good. Yeah, I wonder why they didn't stay. Probably because they didn't get paid enough. Probably. <laughs> oh, you want to call it, dude? Yeah, I think our shit's been shot this week, cousin. I think so. Probably at one of the longer ones. Mm-hmm. Follow us on Instagram, Grandma's Room Podcast. That's our handle. YouTube, Grandma's Room Podcast. Rumble, Grandma's Room Podcast. Spotify. We have Yeah, we have our playlists on Spotify. Yeah, we listen each week, so I hope you've listened to the past ones because I don't feel like listening. To them. We'll say it here. We'll say it again. Wait, we've said it here. We'll say yeah. it again. I will go through the list. Grandma's Trap House. That's rap. Grandma's Guitar Case. That's rock. Grandma's Jukebox. That's classic, like oldies. Grandma's Saloon. That's old country. Grandma's uh, Opium Den. That's like chill vibe music. Grandma's Crimbus Tree. You get Don't the trap worry house. about that until... Yeah, I think that was the first one. Okay. Don't worry about Crimbus Tree until Christmas. After, <laughs> after Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Only after Thanksgiving. Has the oldies, like like um, Bob Crosby. Or wait. Bing Crosby. Bing. <laughs> I said Bob Crosby. He did a... It, Bob Crosby's the guy who sing like a... Uh, way back home. Yeah. And they were related. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Were they like... Brothers. Oh, they were brothers. Mm-hmm. I mean, it looks just like them. I don't... I don't know. I never uh, paid attention. Well, I, I don't know if you've ever seen like on the album covers, like if you've been listening to the Fallout thing, they look I've, just like each other. I, I just never paid attention, I guess. Do you know that Sidney Crosby and Bing Crosby are related? I feel like you're fucking with me. I, I I swear on my life. I think Bing Crosby is like his second great uncle or something like that. Well, Sidney Crosby's Canadian, right? Yeah. Don't ask me how that happened, but... I mean, but just because you're from different countries doesn't mean you can't be related. I just well, guess I never... But he's from a lesser country. Just kidding. <laughs> we like Letter Kenny and Trailer Park Boys a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're also on all audio, like Spotify iTunes, the Google. podcast itself. I mean, Google, Stitcher, all stuff, all kinds of stuff like yeah, that. All kinds of shit. So, uh, stay golden, honey boy. <laughs>